Want to listen to this Ivory Tower Boiler Room or True Crime and Academia episode ad free? Head on over to our Patreon, p a t r e o n dot com slash Ivory Tower Boiler Room to listen to all of our podcast episodes without any ads. You get access to our video episodes, our bonus episodes, and even more exclusive content, including merchandise. It only starts at five dollars a month, so head on over to our Patreon. Again, it's p a t r e o n dot com slash Ivory Tower Boiler Room. And while you're at it, you know what would be such a help is if you could rate and review the Ivory Tower Boiler Room on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and make sure that you follow us and share out our podcast to all of your friends. It truly does help, and I want to thank you all. It means so much that you're listening to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. I hope that you enjoy this episode. Hey, true crime friends. Welcome back to another episode of True Crime in Academia. I am your host, Mary DePippi. I hope you all had a wonderful week this week. I personally am looking forward to the most amount of sleep this weekend. I had such a busy weekend last weekend. And I didn't get like my weekend slash reset sleep. So I've been kind of cranky all week, (laughs) to be honest with you. So, I'm really excited to be able to get some actual decent sleep and, you know, just sleep until I feel like sleeping and not waking up because I have to wake up because I want to wake up, you know, even though like it's crazy because I did take off today, but like, fuck if I would have known. (laughs) it's like this morning my boyfriend and I like it was exciting we had appointments to see houses so we did that in the morning but then like I had podcast stuff and then I had an appointment to get fitted for contacts and I haven't had contacts in a very long time like 2016 maybe like I don't even fucking know and even then like when I had them at that time it wasn't a regular thing it was an occasional thing so you know, it's definitely weird. I actually, I have them in right now and I'm definitely not going to show you all because (laughs) you can see the dark bags under my eyes and just all of the things that, you know, my wonderful glasses covered before then. So, (laughs) you know, but anyway, I just have to get used to them and whatnot. So yeah, it's just, it's been a day. It's been a day. It's been a week. It's been a week before the week so like I said I'm just I I fucking need to go to bed I'm so tired uh this week on the news update we have some interesting cases the one I just noticed it's starting to pick up some circulation but not much um because it's a very sort of niche uh market genre what have you But it is a podcast that I have been listening to a lot. It's actually one of the first true crime podcasts that I started listening to. So for those of you who know, I've actually referenced them on this podcast and used them as sources on quite a few episodes. Um, It is the last podcast on the left. Um, For those of you who have listened to that podcast and are fans, you might have an idea of what's going on. Or what I'm about to talk about. But for those of you who don't know, there have, over this past month, there have been rumors and allegations against hosts, one of the hosts of the last podcast on the left podcast, Ben Kissel. And these allegations come from his ex girlfriend, Taylor. And it's been on her Instagram and TikTok and other social medias that she's been coming out about these allegations. 
Now, the couple started dating the summer, I believe, of 2022 and broke up this past July. Early September, though, Taylor made an Instagram post alleging being pinned down by an ex and being verbally being, excuse me, verbally abused. However, she did not mention which ex of this, you know, of hers this was. Shortly after, though, she noticed a drop in her following. And for her, you know, she is an OnlyFans entrepreneur. She's also a hairstylist. So she had some sort of following. And this was her main means of communicating with her clientele and everything. So, you know, for her, this was a big deal. You know, it's not like... And it actually translated into dollars for her. So... Well, actually, I shouldn't say that. I'm alleging that it would then turn into dollars because, you know, less followers, less paying followers, you know. So even though I can't say that 100 percent sure, but that seems to be the motivation behind her having posted this. The drop in numbers, that is not the allegations of abuse. Since then, Taylor's Instagram accounts have been suspended due to the massive amounts of trolls and supposed fans of the podcasts who had been reporting her account. On September 13th, Marcus Parks and Henry Zabrowski, the other two owners or two-thirds of the podcast, last podcast on the left, and the network, last podcast network, made an announcement that Ben would taking would be taking a sabbatical from the podcast to take care of his physical and mental health. But there was never any mention of Taylor in that. Since then, Taylor has used social media to plead for help from the podcast and the network online because of the, you know, vitriol and horrible DMs and the account suspensions that she's been facing, you know, again, because of their fan base. Now, Marcus and Henry, well, technically Marcus, if you listen to it, there has been a statement that has come out fourth since then, um, you know, of them saying that they do not condone any or, you know, will not stand for any type of abuse against, you know, quote, Ben's ex-girlfriend, end quote. You know, and I do think, you know, They are being truthful. I don't think that they're saying that because they think that's what fans want to hear. I think they really are, you know, understanding of this or trying to understand this situation and do feel a lot of sympathy and empathy for this girl. And obviously don't want that. I mean, that's not... You should never bully anyone. I mean, for the fact that some of these people claim to be fans of this show... You know, I just am like, do you pay attention? Do you not pay attention to the patterns of what happens to these people? Like, obviously, I'm not saying I'm not trying to lump Taylor in with, you know, serial killer category. But I'm just trying to point out for the fact that, like, as a community of people who learn about this, you should fucking know how horrible bullying is against another human being. So I'm kind of, you know, like, fuck you. Like, I'm also, aside from the fact that I'm, like, pissed off at Ben for what he did, because I do believe Taylor, obviously. And I do believe that he did these things because, you know, also she is making claims that a lot of this happened because of his alcoholism, which I'm going to talk about in just a second. But, you know, like, (sighs) yeah. So the fact that, you know, Marcus and Henry really do come out and seem to be genuine and do not want any of this type of behavior from their fans to continue, you know, I think says a lot. They put it, as far as I can tell, in front of almost every single episode that they've aired since then. So, you know, they really are trying to drive this home, I think. And, you know, obviously, like I said, they don't condone it. And I'm inclined I'm inclined to believe them because I like them, but like I said, I also feel like it's genuine. They also stated that they are, quote, still learning more, end quote, but that they do take this situation, quote, very seriously, end quote. 
On October 4th, the podcast posted to Instagram stating that Ben was no longer a part of the podcast, nor the network. It is said that Ben Kissel is currently at a rehab facility getting treatment for alcohol abuse, and I hope that is true. I do hope that he is getting the help that he needs. However, you know, people need to stop fucking with Taylor. And just, I mean, and anyone, because there was another case. I'm not going to bring it up right now. You can look at it and the source. There is a timeline from a Reddit post that I found um, that details all of this. So you can look there. Um, There was another claim against Ben. She is also showing support for Taylor. You know, so I'm just, I'm not saying that this is necessarily 100% a pattern of behavior, but that it's something that has happened before. You know, but again, in an atmosphere, I'm sorry, I should say, or add that, you know, again, in an environment of drinking, but again, that's no excuse. I, yeah, I just, I really hope he gets the help that he needs, but I also hope that the abuse towards Taylor stops, and I hope that she is heard and seen throughout all of this, and... You know, like, I fucking hate that, like, the woman is always the one who gets the shit end of the stick regardless. <laughs> and sometimes in these situations. And, you know, for those fans who were out there, you know, posting hate, DMing, reporting Taylor, all of that. You know, you then, you know, you're no worse than some of these people we study. Like, I said earlier... You know, we are some, you know, the true crime community, the people who are interested in it, like, (sighs) y'all know how fucking bad bullying is. And I wanted to bring this up, I mean, not only specifically now, but it is, you know, anti-bullying month, but I mean, there were also some more recent developments. I technically got, you know, quote quote unquote lucky in that respect, I guess, but you know, just just stop. Just stop. Like, what are you doing? You're also committing a crime by committing harassment. I mean, may, you know, most likely you're not going to get arrested for it. But, <laughs> I mean, then what kind of fucking, like, oh my god. Empathetic, unempathetic true crime fans are, like, the fucking worst, man. I swear. Like, <sighs> Some of you are probably going to hate me for saying that. Well, actually, no. I don't think anyone in this listener base would. But, you know, I feel like the majority of true crime fa- fans are very empathetic and sympathetic people. However, I just feel like the people that are fans of the last podcast, not all of them, but the ones that I'm saying are attacking Taylor. Those individuals are not a part of that. So... <laughs> Just get your shit together, y'all. Just fucking... Mm. Mm. This next case also makes my fucking blood boil. A fourth grade teacher in Tennessee is... Or had been accused and has been since arrested for raping a former student and is alleging that she is now pregnant with that child's baby. Earlier this month, Alyssa McCommon, age 38 was arrested and charged with raping a 12-year-old boy and inappropriately contacting other young boys via video games and social media. McCommon is already a mother of two, somehow, and was released on a $25,000 bond as long as she did not contact the victim or any other minors besides her children. Of course, when that happened, she pleaded not guilty. She was then rearrested on September 28th after allegedly stalking and harassing the victim, who she was quoted texting, saying that he would, quote, regret, end quote, going to the authorities. Other text exchanges show that McCommon admitted to the assault and pregnancy while assuring the child that she would raise their baby and would never speak to them again. There is also a reported, uh, excuse me, a recorded phone call in which McCommon alleges that the baby is fathered by this victim. A 
Upon the second arrest, thankfully, I don't know why it wasn't done in the first place, but in this this circumstance, the judge thankfully revoked McCommon's bond. Other evidence discovered by police include the use of a code word to signal when the child was alone, to which then McCommon would send nudes via Snapchat. McCommon is scheduled to return to court on November 27th for a preliminary hearing. Anyone with information regarding this case is encouraged to contact the Covington Police at 901-475-1261. Again, I sound like a telephone operator, but the number is 901-475-1261. All right, that is all for the news update. We're going to take a quick break and we will be back with this week's case. Hi, this is Dr. Andrew Rimby, and I'm so excited to shout out the Gay and Lesbian Review, who is helping to sponsor the ITBR podcast. For all of you out there, the Gay and Lesbian Review is a bi-monthly magazine where you can discover new things about gay and lesbian literature, history, and culture. And the GL Review publishes essays in a wide range of disciplines, as well as a slew of reviews of books, plays, and movies, and a number of special features, such as artist profiles and their popular art memo column. Each issue of the magazine brings you consistently intelligent, lively, thought-provoking articles focused on a unifying theme. For example, their September-October issue centers on the theme, Cracking the Closet. So, starting in the 19th century, a number of artists and writers found ways to crack the closet by expressing their sexuality between the lines or in the interstices of their work. For example, Ignacio Darnad, who is a friend of the ITBR podcast, he's been on our show, writes all about illustrator J.C. Leyendecker, whose work for Ivory Soap and Arrow Collars gave him plenty of opportunities to draw pictures of well-dressed and at times scantily dressed American men. And you also can find an article by Vernon Rosario, who has been on the podcast, and he talks about the quest for sex in the Middle Ages. So, to subscribe, visit glreview.org, that's G-L-R-E-V-I-E-W.org. Click subscribe, so on their website, go all the way over to the right-hand side and you'll see the button subscribe. Click subscribe and enter the promo code ITBR50 because you're getting 50% off your subscription to the print or digital edition of the Gay and Lesbian Review magazine. I can't wait for you all to have your copy of the Gay and Lesbian Review magazine and make sure that you take a picture when your magazine arrives or when you're reading it online and tag the GL Review on Instagram and ITBR and we'll share it out in our stories. Enjoy your reading, everyone. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Andrew Rimby, and I am so excited to be talking about Broadview Press. You might be asking, what is Broadview Press, Andrew? Broadview is an independent academic publisher in the humanities that produces high-quality, pedagogically useful books for use in university and college classrooms. They publish in the humanities mainly English studies, writing, philosophy, and history, just to name a few genres. And recently, I had on Dr. Jason Holt, who wrote all about the philosophy of sport. And what better summer episode than to talk about what happens when a philosopher dissects the beautiful aesthetics of sporting culture. In the spring, I had on Drs. Kyle Stedman and Tanya Rodriguez to talk about what is sound writing, how to make audio projects in the college classroom, how to even have your students create podcasts. And then in the winter, I had on Dr. E- Dr. Jeffrey Weinstock. He talked about analyzing pop culture. Yes, I even sneak in some Real Housewives questions. And how to teach composition and make it fun. He uses this whole metaphor about being a mad scientist in this gothic lab. And in the fall, I had on Dr. Ann Stevens, and she talked about literary theory and criticism. And yes, the university season is upon us. So. What better way to talk about 
the college classroom than to actually understand what is literary theory. That's a wonderful episode for all of you out there who teach literary studies. I love Broadview Press. Make sure you use their exclusive code. It's Ivory Tower on broadviewpress.com. You get 20% off all, all Broadview Press publications. Okay, until the next Broadview Press interview. And now back to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Hi, everyone. This is Andrew, and I am interrupting what I know is such an exciting Ivory Tower Boiler Room episode to tell you all about one of my favorite podcasts. It's called That Old Gay Classic Cinema, and it's hosted by Christian Garcia. Christian is joined with guest co-hosts to talk about classic cinema films that we know and love, and he analyzes them through a queer lens. So, He's talked about The Sound of Music, Alfred Hitchcock, The Wizard of Oz, Sleeping Beauty, 101 Dalmatians, and recently, Hello, Dolly. I actually was on his first ever episode to talk about my love of The Sound of Music and playing Captain Von Trapp in my high school musical. Then I was joined with Mary DePippi, the host of True Crime in Academia, and our friend Travis Roundtree to talk about Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo. Mary just had Christian on True Crime and Academia to talk about female poisoners, including the evil queen from Snow White and actual real life female poisoners. So Christian's podcast is the best. You must add it to your listen list. After you listen to this episode, make sure you head over to That Old Gay Classic Cinema on Apple and Spotify. Make sure you follow him on Instagram at That Old Gay Classic Cinema. And he's also on TikTok. Don't forget TikTok. Okay. I can't wait for you all to listen to That Old Gay Classic Cinema. And now back to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. On Monday, February 9th, 2004, at around 7.27 p.m., a local resident of Haverhill, New Hampshire, heard a loud noise near her home. The woman went outside to look and saw that a car accident had taken place near her home and a car was stuck in a ditch, so she called 911. Shortly after, a bus driver traveling on the same road saw the accident and went over to help. He spoke to the driver, who appeared to be shaken up, but did not notice any injuries. He offered the driver help and to call 911, but the driver refused, saying that they had already called AAA. The bus driver knew, thankfully, that there was no cell phone reception in that area, but obliged the driver. However, when he got to his home, which was close by, he called 911 and reported the accident. When the first officer arrived at around 7.46 p.m., the driver was nowhere to be found. Police searched the area for the missing driver to no avail, and that was the last time that anyone had seen Mara Murray in the past 19 years. Mara Murray was born on May 4, 1982 in Brocktown, Massachusetts. She was the second youngest child born to Fred Murray, who worked as a medical technician, and Lori Murray, who worked as a nurse. Mara's older siblings included an older brother and two older sisters, and she also had a younger brother. So she was one of five children. So that is a huge-ass household. I mean, I watched three children, and that was enough of a circus for me. To be like, because initially I'd, I, for me, <laughs> I had always thought that I wanted to have three kids. And then when I watched them, I was like, yeah, no, I do not like the severity of the outnumberedness. I think I can deal with two. <laughs> so, you know, we'll see if that changes for me. But like I'm trying to say, I can't even imagine how crazy that household was with five children running around. Holy shit. Not even to mention the bills. I mean, thank God. This was back in time where you could actually afford to have five fucking children working in a hospital field like the two of them did. You know, I mean, that is sadly, I feel like not at all possible today. So I also want to mention that a lot of the source information for this is coming from Mara Murray 
is missing, I believe, dot org. Um, there is a, I'm sorry if I got that wrong. It's in my sources in the show notes here. Um, but it is specifically a website that was formed by Maura's family, specifically her one older sister, Julie. Um, if I'm correct in thinking, I think Julie is the sister that is like the one that is older than her, not her oldest sister, but older. Um, but she, it looks like she runs the website and she also has a TikTok where she talks about her sister. And I think, you know, that's really amazing. I'm always just so astounded by these family members, especially these close family members of murder victims and how they are able to turn their grief into something positive, you know, because in my opinion, like, I don't think you should turn your grief into anything negative, but the fact that, you know, some of these people go above and beyond to get out there and share their story and essentially desensitize because they're re-traumatizing themselves every time they explain their story you know, in a way, you know, I'm not saying that's consistent with everyone, but just, you know, I can't imagine just having to tell your story over and over and over and over again, especially like talking about the murder of someone. I mean, something so traumatic. I mean, I just give them so much credit. If it were me, I, like I said, I wouldn't want to turn it into anything negative, but I would just want to be left alone and just continue with my life. So the fact that they're trying to make it better for other people, I think, is just amazing. Maura was described by her friends and family as an overachiever in both academics and athletics. She was considered an active member of her community and was well known for her kind heart, her dimples, and her smile. By all accounts, she had a normal and loving upbringing. The only potentially traumatic event in her life that was mentioned was that her parents divorced when she was six. She was a fierce cross-country competitor who broke several long-standing records at her school. She was also selected as a Boston Gold Globe All-Scholastic in co- cross-country, excuse me, and as a high school sophomore, she qualified for the U.S. National Scholastic outdoor championship and overall in the country she finished in 33rd I mean there's 50 fucking states you know so that's already good considering but then you know if you have multiple people from the same area I mean I just I don't know the pool of people but even if it's out of 50 people like that is still really fucking good like Mara does not fuck around. I feel like she is the type of girl who kicks ass and takes names, and I love that about her. Now, as far as her academics go, Mara, of course, graduated at the top of her class at Whitman Hanson Regional High School. After high school, even though she had her pick, Mara accepted a congressional nomination from the late Senator Edward Kennedy and joined the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. Also, her sister Julie was there attending. So clearly, you know, just excelling at things, I feel like, just runs in this family. And I feel like she was no different. So, but I mean, you know, I feel like it was mentioned so nonchalantly. Like, you know, she could have went anywhere, but instead she accepted. She accepted, excuse me, this congressional nomination from Senator Edward Kennedy. I mean, like, I can't say that I know what that is. However, that sounds fancy as fuck. And also, like, a one and maybe not a million, but, like, it just seems like it's a very slim chance that this one senator could be like, yes, I nominate you specifically to get into the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. Like, again, I don't know for sure, but to me, the way that it sounds, it seems like a huge fucking deal. Of course, as I'm sure you all can guess, Mara did exceedingly well in the Military Academy. However, she decided for herself that the military just was not for her. So she left and decided to pursue a nursing career 
and wanted to study at and did study at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And it seems from there, I couldn't find anything specific that gave me like dates. I don't even actually know this person's name. But from what I'm gathering, it seems that she met her boyfriend there. LGBT stories are universal, but each one speaks to the individual heart and soul of the writer telling it. Do you have a story to tell? Or have you been moved by an LGBT book, film, painting, television show, or other form of media? Then the Gay and Lesbian Review wants to hear from you. The GNLR believes in bringing awareness to queer art and artists through reviews, commentary, and thought pieces in which the author relates their personal lives to a particular piece of art, a novel, a movie. In addition to the print magazine, the GNLR also publishes articles on its blog. So you can see all of this on glreview.org. That's G-L-R-E-V-I-E-W.org. Remember, you get 50% off your subscription of the GL Review magazine when you use the promo code ITBR50. That's 50% off your print or digital subscription when you use promo code ITBR50. To learn more about submitting an article for the GNLR, Visit their writer's guidelines. The link is located at the bottom of their homepage. And if you have any questions, email Stephen Hemrick. That's S-T-E-P-H-E-N dot H-E-M-R-I-C-K at glreview.org. The GNLR and its readers can't wait to see what you have to say. Hey, Ivory Tower Boiler Room listeners and true crime friends. You've heard me gush over this incredible woman and her beautiful products. I'm talking about Mandy Made It. Mandy makes customized and original crochet and cre-cut goods. They are the perfect, unique, one-of-a-kind gift for literally anyone in your life. And she makes incredible home decor. I still have my pumpkins that I put out every fall. I just love them. Check her out on Instagram at M-A-N-D-E-E Made It or search Mandy Made It on Facebook. To order, just slide into her DMs. And if you mention the Ivory Tower Boiler Room, you will receive a free personalized gift with your first order. So go on Instagram and look up at Mandy Made It and Mandy is spelled M-A-N-D-E-E. Again, her handle is at Mandy Made It. Mandy spelled M-A-N-D-E-E. And order today. Mara submitted her nursing homework electronically on the morning of February 9th, 2004. She also sent emails to her professor stating that she would be leaving campus for the week due to a death in the family. However, according to her family members, this was a lie. There had been no death in the family. Maura then placed a call to the owner of a condo rental in Bartlett, New Hampshire, and it's assumed that she was asking to rent out the property. It was also said that Maura had spent time at this particular condo in the past, and it was kind of special to her. At around 3.15 p.m., Mara is seen stopping at an off-campus ATM, and she withdrew almost her entire account, which she pulled out from what was said from according to the bank records and everything, was $280. So, you know, again, this is 2004. I know it's not like the 90s or the 80s where things were great, but $280, like that was a decent amount of change you know she was then seen at a liquor store and bought around forty dollars worth of alcohol according to authorities mara left amherst or the amherst area around 4 30 p.m in her 1996 saturn and she was heading towards new hampshire according to her friends and family she didn't tell anyone what her plans were in new hampshire or why she was even going there The next sighting of Mara is when the Haverhill woman, 
hears the loud noise outside, which her home was near the road Route 112, which was the road that Mora was driving on when her car, you know, went into a ditch. As I mentioned at the top of the episode, the woman then calls 911. This was around 7.27 p.m. When the bus driver pulls up and speaks to Mara, it is sometime around 7.53 or 7.35, my apologies. Um, and that is my guess personally. Um, it might have even been sooner, but because it was said that at the time he was living roughly 100 yards from the accident. So when his 911 call came in at 9.42, you know, we can kind of assume that maybe there was like maybe a five minute period. I don't know. Maybe a little less. You know, 100 yards isn't super far. So he got there pretty quickly. And I don't know. And it's not recorded or documented anywhere how much time he spent talking to Mara. So, you know. These are just other factors of time. Like I said, the first call came in at 727 and then his call came in at 742. So we have less than 20 minutes of time from when the accident happened, when Mara was last seen, and when the second 911 call comes in. So it's possible that in between the time when she spoke to the bus driver and he called 911, she went missing. However, or not however, but also the first officer arrived on the scene at 746, which I know that's like, what, four minutes? But I mean, I feel like in a missing person's case, every minute is crucial. So, you know, there's an, potentially an extra four minutes In the window of when she could have gone missing. Because of course by the time he got there. She was already gone. The officer went to investigate her car. And he reports that the car had been locked. And that there was a box of red wine. Behind the driver's seat. My guess is that it was Franzia. I have no evidence to support that. But that is my guess. Because that is a favored box wine of most people. He also noticed that there was a coke bottle filled with red liquid and that there were also stains on the ceiling of the car and the door now on the outside of the car he found that there was a rag that was stuffed into Mara's tailpipe and it was said that this was done because she had been stopped for the emissions that were coming out of her car so it was said that she did that to kind of stop that He also noticed that, like, her credit cards, ID, and cell phone were missing from the car, which would technically be consistent if Mara walked off willingly on her own. The officer enlisted the help of the bus driver who called the 911 call in and asked him to search the roads in the French Pont area just to see if there was any sign of her. A state trooper also responded to the scene. It's unclear as to who was responding to what call. Because remember, there was two 911 calls that came in. So both of them were responding to this. But it's unclear as to which call specifically. Whether it was the woman's or the bus driver's. But given that the officer first on the scene knew to contact the bus driver... I would say it's safe to say that he was responding to the bus driver's call and the state trooper was responding to the woman's call. Not that that matters 100%, but it's just an explanation as to why they would both be there. The state trooper joins in the search and the fire department also responds. And eight of the firefighters that were there joined in the search. Sadly, that night they were not able to locate her. The next day, a, quote, be on the lookout, end quote, report for Mara was issued. Mara's father was called at around 3.20 p.m. that following day that the accident occurred, but he wasn't home, so a voicemail was left. The call only stated that Mara's car had been found abandoned, which, it just hurts my heart because I know for me personally, I would be guilt stricken, like no matter what the circumstances, like even if like me getting the call 
at that time would have mattered or not. Like it still would have bothered me that I didn't get the call. And I would have felt guilty that I wasn't there to answer that call at the time that it came in. Because it wasn't until 5 p.m. that Mara's older sister, and I think it might be Julie. I'm not 100% sure if it was Julie or her other sister. But one of Mara's older sisters heard the voicemail and was able to get a hold of their father and tell him the situation immediately. At around 5.17 p.m., Mara was considered a missing person. February 11th, which is the day after last, Mara's father arrived in Haverhill, New Hampshire, and a search for Mara began at around 8 a.m. A police dog was able to track her scent about 100 yards from where her car was found, but sadly lost the scent. Mara's boyfriend was brought in for questioning, but it seems from everything I've read that he was never considered a suspect or a prime suspect at any moment in time or person of interest for that matter. More organized searches for Mara continued up until from literally when she went missing in 2004 up until around 2010. One of the theories that police floated to the media was that Mara was suicidal, which her family insists and insisted at the time wasn't true and isn't true. The police also claimed that Mara was intoxicated at the scene, but the bus driver who talked to her claims that she showed no signs of being impaired, only being shaken up over the fact that her car was now in a ditch. I don't know why the police decided that they needed to say any of these things publicly. I really don't like the way that those statements paint Mora, as I'm sure her family didn't either. You know, it's just so frustrating. And, you know, sometimes it's just better to not say anything. And I know in the world today, in the media and everything, we are so like instant gratification I need it and I need it now (laughs) but to even float those false theories about Mara and her person and you know making assumptions for her and her circumstances you know I just I don't think that's fair without hard evidence and I don't think having a bunch, like, you know, $40 worth of alcohol or wine in her car and wanting to go stay somewhere in New Hampshire, and, you know, at this condominium that she had stayed at that she already enjoys being at was a huge deal. You know, like, I feel like it may have, start, you know, I don't know. Maybe there could have been other theories floating around. Maybe she was meeting someone there. I don't know. But from the information I'm given, it just seems like she was just trying to get away for a little bit. You know, she pulled the typical, you know, my grandmom died, you know, which just a reminder to everyone, you can only use that excuse twice. (laughs) You use it three and four times. You're going to have to get into step relations, which if you don't have, then you're going to have a lot of explaining to do. But, (laughs) you know, So I just, you know, I just think it was her just trying to get away. And sadly, I think something horrible happened. And what's terrifying is that it can happen in such a short amount of time. In September 2021, bone fragments were found in the same area that Mara went missing. Sadly, they did not belong to Mara, but it did raise a lot of hope for the family. Instead, though, for those of you who are curious, the fragments, the bone fragments, seem to belong to a woman who most likely died between the years 1718 and 1893. So it's kind of one of those things where it was like, okay, you saw bone fragments and the gender matched up, but, you know, the date of death clearly, clearly did not match. Maura Murray is still considered missing to this day. 
The 21-year-old nursing student was last seen wearing a dark jacket and jeans along Route 112 in Haverhill, New Hampshire. If you or anyone you know have any information about Maura Murray's disappearance, please contact the New Hampshire Police Department or go to the DOJ and H link in my sources below. And from there, you can access the tip form. That is all I have for you this week, my loves. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend and a wonderful start to your week. Please don't forget to follow True Crime and Academia on social media at True Crime and Academia on Instagram and TikTok and at TC on or at TC in Academia on Twitter or X or whatever the fuck we're calling it. <laughs> you know, whatever that thing is. Um, also, don't forget to become a subscriber on our Patreon at patreon.com slash ivorytowerboilerroom. That is the best and only way to join the book club. So go there, pick which tier, you know, pick the book club tier actually, and I will see you live and in person then, for those who do that. But for everyone else, I will see you all next week. And until then, my loves, I will see you all later. Hi, this is Dr. Andrew Rimby. I want to thank you so much for listening to the ITBR and TCIA episodes. Make sure if you don't follow, rate, and review us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Also, make sure you follow ITBR on TikTok and Instagram at Ivory Tower Boiler Room and TCIA on TikTok and Instagram at True Crime and Academia. Also, we have a brand new Patreon membership system. So I just want to explain it to you all quickly. So if you want to become an ITBR student, it is $5 a month. You get ad-free ITBR and TCIA episodes and video interviews. If you want to become an ITBR professor for $10 a month, you get all of those ad-free benefits, but you also get access to both the ITBR and TCIA book clubs. You can join both book clubs, get ad-free episodes, plus you're going to get all of our extra video episodes. So I am re-watching Queer as Folk. Christian Garcia from That Old Gay Classic Cinema is joining us, and he's re-watching Smash. Um, Mary is going to start to re-watch shows as well. You even get access to what I'm calling the ITBR teaches. So if I'm recapping a movie or a TV show, including Barbie, um, Halloween movies and horror films, you get access to that as well. And then I also am offering consultation services. So for $30, you get your first initial consultation with me. It's a one hour private Zoom. I will help create a, your podcast, your media brand. How do you navigate academia as an undergrad or a grad student? Do you need help with technology? It could be teaching tools, Spotify for podcasters, video editor so software. Do you want to expand your social media presence as an artist, writer, podcaster, or academic? Do you want help on how to create a public humanities identity like I've created for myself? So I now I'm offering that consultation service. You can find more info about it on Patreon. And you also can join our book clubs. If you want to just join the ITBR book club or the TCIA book club, you can do that for $4 a month. Patreon.com backslash Ivory Tower Boiler Room. That is P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Thanks to the team, Mary DePippi, our chief contributor. And thank you to our two new interns from Stony Brook University, Jonathan and Sarah. Bye, everyone. Until next time.